May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So if you were with us on Friday or whatever day that was, they all blend together at this point. Plus, when my kids are out of school, I forget what day of the week it is. You know, it was like 80 degrees on Christmas, which is crazy. And it reminds me of when I was serving a church in suburban Houston in 2017. And that fall, right, Hurricane Harvey came through. And so my church became an embarkment center. It's a term used in recovery world for a place that can't be an overnight shelter for whatever reason, but it's a place where the boats could come into our parking lot, right? Because boats came into the parking lot. People could dry off and, you know, wait for the big trucks to take them to shelters. I think I've shared a little bit about that. But it reminded me, right, I think this is late August, September, whatever it was, um, and people just flooded our church with donations, right? Diapers, socks, underwear, winter coats, think about the timing of this. It's like 102 degrees. The entire city's underwater. So Houston's already humid. You can imagine when like there's enough water to shrink the earth's crust around Houston an inch, right? That's what happened. These winter coats were great. (laughs) It made me think we could have used those Christmas Eve. It also had me reflecting on that time in Harvey that I haven't shared what my family went through. We lived in West Houston. And so if you remember, because up here my mom would see it on the news, right? It's really great when your mom's getting news from the county to know about you because you're not checking in with your mother. (laughs) It's great. And Judge Emmett would be on the news and he'd have the folks from the Corps of Engineers and all of these folks and they'd be looking at these maps, right? And you've probably, if Maybe these aren't scarred in your memory like they are mine, but there's these maps of, like, here's the places that are safe, here's the places that maybe not, here's these two reservoirs, right? And there was all this talk about these things are filling up, right? And they got to do something because if the, they breach, like downtown Houston would have flooded. And so then they say, so we're going to let off some steam, we're going to open up some gates. <laughs> Those gates were like half a mile from my neighborhood, Right, And so the Corps of Engineers made the decision, right, that my neighborhood could take on some water because the rest of Houston needed to be saved, right? And so my mom learns about this from the news and tries to call me, and it's great. But the thing with all of this is, like, this was after the storm, right? We all saw the footage of people going into houses with axes to cut away roofs and saving people's lives, right? Like, my life was never in danger, but my neighborhood was preparing to flood. We, like, got to witness this in slow motion because it was deliberate decisions, right? And so while we were never at risk, we had to sit around with our neighbors. The sun is shining, But the water kept rising because as the water from all over Houston channels into these two reservoirs, number one, they have to go through the bayous that go through my neighborhood, but then they come to these golf courses, which is what the the reservoirs are as public parks. They spill over and they come into my neighborhood. So my neighbors and I at this one bayou, we put this, we thought we were being really smart. We put this measuring stick in the ground and we marked off, right? And so we were like, you know, if it gets to here, we're going to be a little bit worried. If it gets to here, we're going to be a little bit more worried. If it gets to here, we're in trouble. Right? We lost that measuring stick somewhere up here. Right? And again, we're all safe. Right? Like the bayou is down low. Houses are built on hills, kind of. We had fairly steep driveways. Our mailbox was down at the end. And so I have these pictures sun is shining through the trees, right? Like it's hot, it's humid. And I see four days after the rain stopped, my mailbox had like a foot of water. A couple hours, it had like two feet of water. A couple hours, my mailbox was underwater. And the sun is shining, but my neighborhood is flooding. 
And we, again, we were fine. Uh, I was helping coordinate things with my church, connecting with other people, the things you do, and disasters. My wife was head of a lower school that was completely destroyed and flooded because it was in another part of Houston that wasn't so lucky. And so she was helping coordinate, finding space for their kids to go to school when schools opened back up. We were doing all of that because we could, because we were safe at home. And then the internet went out. (laughs) And like even more important that we could no longer do work, my seven and nine-year-old kids no longer had Netflix. And so that's when we knew we were in trouble. (laughs) That's no joke. When Netflix went out, we called the Cajun Navy. (laughs) <laughs> it's no joke, right? Like, if you've ever been in one of these situations, you know there's like this nationwide network of people who volunteer for the Cajun Navy, and there's people that are dispatchers, and they're all connected. We're connected through these apps, and it's a wonderful thing that was built out of tragedy. And so we download this walkie-talkie thing to your phone, and you talk to this dispatcher and say, you know, I've got four people and a dog, and, and we need rescue. Here's our address. And they put you on this list, and they check back. Are there any medical conditions? No. Are there what? It's very structured for something that is completely fly by the seat of your pants. And so we wait for a little bit, and then this boat comes into our driveway. And we go, and we have four backpacks, right? We leave our house. Water's still rising when we leave the house. We don't know what we're coming back to. We each have backpacks. I have one on the front and the back. I'm carrying this stupid dog. We left the cats to fend for themselves. (laughs) And we trudge out through the water and we climb into this boat. And this boat takes us out of the neighborhood. This boat was two fishermen from Virginia who drove 18 hours through the night to come to Houston and to find random highways and streets where they could launch their boat and go help people because they didn't know what else to do. And so this boat takes us out to Eldridge Parkway. If you're familiar with Houston, Eldridge is this really big street. It's like six lanes wide, and it's set up, and you get out there, and there's cars lined up as far as you can see, and they're waiting for people like us to come out of this neighborhood because you think, like, We were in the midst of a flood when we were in our house. Everything seemed chaotic. And you go out to Eldridge to the main road, it is bone dry, and the sun is shining. But people come off these boats, and they have four backpacks and a dog. And the next guy up in line is a man named Jose. He's a lawn guy, doesn't speak much English, but he has a truck. And he and his broken English, me and my broken Spanish, we negotiate on a place for him to take us where we'll find some other friends to come pick us up. And we drive four or five miles to a major intersection. And we get out and I try to give the guy money for gas or for whatever. And in our conversation, he says, I didn't know what else to do. And so I'm driving my truck to take people. And then this intersection that he dropped us off at, at a jack-in-the-box, is a place where folks experiencing homelessness tend to congregate. It's one of Houston's major intersections where there's a lot of traffic and Houston struggles with how to deal with these situations. And so we're sitting, you know, four people with backpacks and this stupid dog. And we're sitting outside a jack-in-the-box waiting for some of our friends to come and pick us up. And a gentleman who looks like he's experiencing homelessness comes up and asks if he can buy us some food. I have to explain, right? Thank you, but we're okay. Hope became flesh in two fishermen from Virginia. Peace became flesh and a lawn guy with a truck. Joy became flesh in people who didn't know what else to do but help. Love became flesh 
in a man experiencing homelessness who wanted to buy food for a family. The word became flesh and lived among us. That's what we celebrated two nights ago. And this word become flesh as a baby grows up to be Jesus who teaches us the way to live in the world. Our gospel today talks about through Jesus we have become adopted and we too have become children of God. And I would say we too have the opportunity to become the word made flesh in the world today. Through Jesus, we have the example of what it looks like. Hope became flesh in a couple fishermen. Peace became flesh in a lawn guy with a truck. Joy became flesh in people who didn't know what else to do but help. Love became flesh in a man experiencing homelessness that wanted to buy a family some food. The word has become flesh. How will we be that hope and peace and joy and love in the flesh today. Amen.